everything that happened in the past, everything in the present, everything in the future is happening all at once. And so we just kind of uh, try to make sense out of it when we're just normal. Up to, up to, up to, up to, up to, up to, up to. Now, troops, you know that there's been some talk here that some of the men have been indulging in some kind of activities that is not condoned. There will be no more consorting with the natives and their rituals and imbibing their mixtures of various drinks and eating certain kinds of uh, baked goods. No, because we must maintain our posture. Carry on, troops. Up to, up to, up to, up to, up to. They were just fantastic people, you know, that you know, put them up against the uptight society we had at that time. And they were a beautiful thing. Everyone was a few feet off the ground that day. We're all on the same planet. We're all in the same place right now. And we're all high. And we're higher because we're all together. Oh, it's like the gypsies. You know, we get together. It's a tribal stomp. That whole counterculture revolution moved up the coast here. They were into community and family. That's what the people in Eugene were into. It was all happening. People were turning on to organic food. It was like a miracle. It was like we, we were going to create a new world. And somewhere in your mind, you're going, God, this could last forever. I want to do this forever. I mean, who would want anything less than that? The Great for Dem saw themselves as part and parcel of the survival of their immediate community in the wider community from which they came. There was a lot of benefits, though, and there was, there, in fact, they probably played, you know, a, a benefit a month for, for quite a long time. No, it had to be the band, it had to be the roadies, and it had to be everybody. Look how everybody worked together. You could just see they're working together. Basically doing this with your friends. You know, it wasn't about going out and making money. It was about making enough money to live. And then, you know, living. The show was excellent. One of the best ever. Surely there are people who've seen quite a few more Grateful Dead shows than I have. But I saw a few. And that was the one to get on film. An adventure making a film about a band that I loved. I didn't follow them around, but they, they seemed to follow me. For a while at the chat, cats on from a bell, walking jingle in the mid night sun. But don't go to drip the silver, come on, I like a crazy. So we'll start out through a dream. Ken's influence on all of this is, you can't underestimate any of that. This connection with the Grateful Dead happened because of Ken. And we knew some of the same people, Paige, and some of the people in KZC were, were friends of ours. And, um, we, we were playing in bars and things like that, but we'd heard about Takizi and the Bus and their whole, the, they've been doing outrageous things for quite a while. He was famous already for giving parties, and uh, notorious, I should say. I feel like you only come to this movie once, and if you don't get something rewarding out of every minute you're sitting there, then you're blowing your ticket. But 
what Jerry said about that is, yeah, we used to go over to Kesey's parties, but he, he would object when we looked in the refrigerator. We kicked him out of the place two or three times. That's where we invited him. Yeah, right. We, we, we weren't exactly welcome guests. Yeah, the whole thing is about uh, yogurt, milk, and that whole scene with the Springfield Creamery. It was just all part of one thing, the Grateful Dead, the yogurt, the natural foods. The whole organic food movement really, really was born here. Before there was such a thing as being green, they were pretty green. The Keys family and the Springfield Creamery, that's the reason this, is, this whole area has an alternative twist. And his brother Chuck took over his dad's business. My dad ran a creamery. They were a milk bottling plant. They were, they were supplying the schools. Processing milk and cheese and cottage cheese and eventually yogurt. There was a new, new thoughts about food, about civil rights, about uh, how you were going to live and what you were going to do. And yogurt was one of the products that people were saying was the new thing happening. The hippies ate yogurt, and in those days, you know, it wasn't a huge community out there of yogurt eaters, uh, although Eugene probably had more than most. Eugene has always been kind of progressive because it's a university town. Bookstores and tea houses and hippie farms all over the place and big giant communal meals and, you know, it was bitching. Here were all these gypsies. Or I mean hippies, I mean, I don't know. All living on the land. Wow, this is great. And we're thinking, hey, this is hippie, euphoria, utopia. We're there. We can live in the woods. They're going to do composting toilets. We can do, we're free. We can run there. We can do anything. Just exploring alternatives to the dominant paradigm. That was not getting us anywhere except into a war we didn't want and presidents we didn't want. So it was a transition, you know, they, they just didn't know. They, they were, well, particularly Springfield, didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know if we were okay or if we were bums. Basically, you know, the, the city was, uh, was worried about us because of the association with Ken and the hippies and worried about drugs, and, you know, so they got wind that we had hippies delivering milk to the schools. Oh my, you know, we had to go defend our position, you know, why we had these people. And Chuck just looked at him and said, listen, one for these hippies, I wouldn't even be in business. The work had to get done. You know, the dishes had to be washed, the gardens had to be planted, the houses were being built, relationships were being created amongst individuals and amongst the entire community. And we were, we were learning about how to create that stuff. You know, it wasn't like any of us really knew how to do it. We weren't concerned about making so much money as we were building a lifestyle. You know, there were these big communes in various places, all rural. Everything was make it yourself. Right, right. I mean, on the back of the wood stove, yeah. you know, we had a big cauldron back there to keep the water at the right temperature. Mm -hmm. Had a thermometer bobbing mm -hmm. in it, you know. So. And jars of milk in there overnight. Mm -hmm. And the morning you'd come down, they'd be yogurt. You'd say yogurt, and people say, "What's that?" <laughs> Having come from San Francisco, Russian yogurt was there, and Greek yogurt. When I came to Oregon, there wasn't any good yogurt, and uh, there was just kind of that sort of grocery store oversweetened, colored, uh, kind of fake flavors. You know, not great yogurt. And um, so I thought, well. I, need, I guess I need to make my own yogurt. <laughs> she was the, definitely the magic behind the yogurt. Chuck and I worked on it together at the creamery. You know, we lowered the, the butter fat and uh, we added some honey just to take the edge off it. It was so good. It was like nothing you ever tasted before. It didn't have gelatin, didn't have white sugar, didn't have with other natural flavors. Nancy and Sue and Black Maria would go out and pick the blueberries on Kesey's farm. I was one of the first yogurt makers and we'd take five gallon buckets and I'd pour it up by hand in all these little eight ounce cups. And the first labels were these little uh, square stick-on things that, that I'd uh, drawn. Little natural food stores were popping up right here in town and we said, well, let's make yogurt for them. And that's where it all started. And 
It didn't hurt that it came from Ken Kesey's brother's creamery. We had some friends who uh, had a comic book um, route in the Bay Area. They went around to the health food stores with the Fuzzy Furry Freak Brothers comics. <laughs> Mr. Natural and, you know, R. Crumb and all that. So they said, why don't we take some of your yogurt down to the Bay Area? We're going to those stores anyway, and uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, if anybody buys it. The first place I ever sold it was at the Good Earth in San Anselmo. I'd walk in with, with the with the, um, the things of yogurt and say, I'm from Oregon and Ken Kesey's brother makes this. Nancy's a real person. She's there working at the creamery and I'd have a spoon and they would try it. It's got acidophilus. I didn't even know what it meant. But um, then the apple wine bust happened and that was, oh, that was kind of an offshoot of the attention that had been given was being given to Ken. I'd rented this house in, in Eugene and it had like eight apple trees. And we just moved in and, and the apples were ready and they were wormy and not real great. And we were trying to figure out what to do with all these apples. And so we had this 200 gallon jacketed tank in the, in the not, not in the creamery, but in the warehouse part of the creamery. So we thought, well, we'll just take them there and squeeze them, fill that vat up with uh, with apple juice and make some apple wine, apple jack, you know. It was going along pretty good. The wine was pretty strong and it was going along pretty good. But dang, uh, I began to worry about it a little bit. He'd come down to pick the yogurt in the middle of the night, like two o'clock in the morning, and it was all over the floor. And he was going, look. And somebody had pulled the damn plug out of the apple wine vat and spilled it on the floor. We're right across the street from the police department too, oh, which God. wasn't real smart. And, and they were watching us like a hawk, thinking that we were probably dealing drugs or something. I came back the next morning and there were 25 cops standing there. They'd come from all over Oregon. <laughs> and newspaper men taking pictures. This was the biggest <laughs> bootlegging, bootlegging thing <laughs> that had gone on in 100 years in Oregon. That happened and they did not get the bid on the school milk for the next year. We had no business. We were zero. The creamery went through kind of an upheaval. When we started yogurt, we were kind of at a breaking point of changing the direction we were going with the creamery. The yogurt hadn't really grown enough. We had to figure out what to do next, and uh, we wanted this little creamery to survive. They needed money to pay the taxes. They owed the tax man money. They owed everybody money. And so they owed me money. It was looking grim. And Bud says, we're, I'm in the middle, Chuck's driving and Bud's in the passenger seat. And he says, man, we need a good money making idea. And just instantly popped into my head, look, you guys know the Grateful Dead, don't you? They do a benefit concert. Chuck says to me, he says, well, we'll send Maria down to ask the Grateful Dead if they'll do a benefit concert for us. She and Bud and Chuck went down and talked to the, to the dead. And, and really talked to Ramrod. He was the one who took it to the dead and said, we need to do this. These are good people. He didn't have to tell us they were good people, but, but he was the guy that sold the crew. Well, for one thing, he was one of the Oregon people, you know, and uh, uh, was part of, kind of felt like he was part of our group, you know, he came up with Hagen's and, and them. Hagen was the one that got us all there. He started it all. Hagen and Ramrod were the first guys with the, with the Grateful Dead. Rex was the next guy down there, and then Herd. So whenever they needed another guy uh, to work for the band, uh, they'd, they'd come get their guys from here. You know, that's just how it, how it went. Uh, you went back and got the guys you trusted and relied on. One of the things I think Ramrod had, you could just feel the energy coming up through the ground through him, you know. He would have been a very strong supporter. His voice, he would have said, yeah, righteous, do it, in probably that, that many words. <laughs> yeah, Ramrod. <laughs> he was a man of not very many words, but when, they, when he spoke, they counted. Yeah. And of course, Jerry was there saying, let's do it. That's what you're supposed to do. 
that was part of our ethos, you know what I mean, man? We, if you're part of a collective scene, right, if somebody breaks down and need, needs help on any level, then of course you help. Jerry always said yes to family. Here were some people, man, that the Grateful Dead loved. They were, by extension, the Grateful Dead's family. So when they, you know, asked for help for the creamery, wasn't it, you know? Of course, you know, the Grateful Dead instinctively just said, of course, we'll, you know, we'll do it. Then it was, oh, well, how are we going to do it? Then all the milkman and the whole gang, uh, uh, the people at the crew, we got thrust into this job of uh, putting on this concert. It was kind of this 28-day rush of, of uh, getting this all together and doing something we'd never, none of us had ever done. Jeff and I, we had, neither of us had ever done anything like this. We, you know, we were feeling our way. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we didn't know how much money to charge. Chuck called me up and says, you want you to go to meet these uh, guys that had toured Europe with the Grateful Dead. John, Sam, and myself went on the Europe 72 tour. I wish I was a headline on a train. We went there basically to really, really absorb the music and I guess think of the future, how are you Maybe we were going to shoot something. John's vision was we could film a concert and then share this with the rest of the world, you know. The enormity of the experience of a fantastic Grateful Dead show was something that he wanted to record. Grateful Dead is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of undertow. It goes um, deep into the water. We didn't know much about the concert before we were told, this is your shot. So we loaded up with the film that we could afford and went to Eugene. Sam Fields shows up with John, and they've been tailing the dead forever, and they want to do a film. I know you're gonna miss me when I God, I mean, any dead show in 1972 was manna. It was, you know, water coming from the skies on a parched earth. The word spread like wildfire, I guess. And one person told another person who told another person, the Grateful Dead are going to do this free concert. Well, my brother pedaled off over to Springfield Creamery, uh, and I think it was 3.50 that uh, I'd sold out for that harder concert ticket. The Creamery, that was really big. That was as big for me as, as the Grateful Dead being there. So if they're needing a fundraiser, of course, we want to support them. Everybody was talking about there's going to be this benefit. We're going to work on setting it up with the hog farm and the pranksters. We loaded up a bunch of kids and uh, took them uh, to Oregon. So we all got on the rainbow bus and went up there. The traffic jam backed up to Fern Ridge. I might have rode up in the back of a flatbed truck with like 10 other people. And it took us a long time to get there. The whole line of traffic was stopped and oh, Michael just jumps out of the convertible with his number we just rolled, runs it up to the car in front, pass it around there, runs his the car in back. <laughs> And it was that sort of feeling all down the line. It's like, well, hey, we're in a traffic jam, but guess what? It's all good. You know, it was, it was, it, nobody said all it's all good back then. As in often 
Grateful Dead history, things get bigger faster than can be dealt with. You just look out and the field is full as far as the eye can see. It's like, wow, where did everybody come from? They'd heard about us because of Tom Fisker, and they heard about what we did at Columbia. And they, and they showed up. People were just streaming in. Pretty soon, people started coming over the gates and started coming around the gates. I can I roll stone after. Taking tickets like from, yeah, five people would go by and we get a ticket. We started sort of feebly saying, tickets, tickets, you know, and then another 10 people would go by and we get three or four tickets. They just kept rushing past us. People had tickets that, that, that had no, nobody to give them to. <laughs> so by that time, it was anarchy. Nobody ever looked at my ticket. I don't remember paying anything. Yeah. <laughs> and I bought the ticket, I, I honest to God. Not that I was trying to cheat anybody. I just, I don't remember $2.50 yeah. or anything of the kind. The money with the Grateful Dead was always incidental to the primary drive. The primary drive was self-realization, if you like, you know, on every level. These guys just wanted to play music. They were just playing music for whoever wanted to listen. The sense of their music was a sense that we all had, was like, we're going to see where this goes. We're going to find out how we play off of each other and what happens here, because we're, we're starting to realize we're in uncharted territory. So much of, uh, of the, the glory of the Grateful Dead is the love affair between the band and the audience. They were with us, no matter how loose the music got. There's something when, when it clicks in the studio or live, there's something magical happens. You could feel that. Plus, it was the hottest day of the year, too. Oregon is famous for its rain in the winter and for beautiful summers. Usually it doesn't get too hot. This day, it decided to get really hot. It started out really warm and uh, it got warmer. It was the hottest Oregon has ever seen. It was a uh, scorcher as I can remember because it was hotter than fuck. just really tough to try to get trucks in there because there's so much traffic on the highway. They made an announcement about the water truck and that it was going to come around and spray everybody. So hang in and we're going to move with the truck just so you know what you're getting hit with so nobody thinks there's something weird coming down on them. It's just water from the creek. So the big tank came in and somehow the guy who was driving it either just abandoned it, got stoned, and just got into the audience and got into it, but it was just empty and the keys were in it. And we're getting ready to let loose, and there's this little kid who is also on the truck, and he says, this stuff smells like sewage. <laughs> As it turns out, it was the guy who was picking up the shit from the porta potties. It's not hot enough. <laughs> I'd never really been in a a uh, place where there's a whole lot of public nudity. I never did get used to walking around without any clothes on, I'll tell you that. We're all born without clothes. Nobody was Nobody embarrassed or anything. Yeah. You know, it was just like, that's just the way it Except was. Except for me. Well, yeah, you all <laughs> were going. People expanding their, their horizons and their brains and their minds. You're liberated for a while from the chains of language and your in another place, in another dimension, you know. Another, you know, parallel universe. That was really one of the most marvelous parts of 
the early days of a Grateful Dead concert was that uh, group focus um, on the multitude of things going on at the, uh, at the same time. You know, it wasn't drugs that was mind expanding, it was the experience that was mind expanding. That was an experience like nothing else. It was shamanic in nature. It was fantastic. You would keep going back and back and back to get that again, you know? But, um, and it didn't happen every time. That's how we did it. We let people come for nothing and played for the heart and soul of it. interesting thing, of course, about the Grateful Dead was that search, whilst it's an individual search, gets enriched by making it a collective search. And the coming together within the orbit of a Grateful Dead concert. And it turned the corner for us, amazingly. We were able to get out of the hole we were in and to, to buy some supplies and to keep going. We went up there to help them and, and really well, to save the cream. It's all timing, and it's not our timing, it's, it's the universe. I wish it was our timing. There is a common belief system involved here that extends beyond the music, and the music is perhaps the most visible aspect. Those are the musician parts of our show. But our show kind of goes like into the life show, and the life show is, we're good people. We were all working the same way to make America a, a better place, a, a, a groovier place, a place where people te uh, treat each other better. All that the Grateful Dead achieved could only ever have been achieved cooperatively. The Grateful Dead wasn't one person, it was a collective thing, and that was the big trip about the Grateful Dead. We're communal species, we can't make it on our own. We all depend on others for so much. What makes a good hippie? I don't know. An awareness of nature, politics, and social mores that's good, right, true, honest, and that we have to respect the earth and all the pieces that go along with it. I think that makes a good hippie. But you don't even have to be a hippie to believe in all that sort of stuff. We are the Grateful Dead. You're the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead represent something so much bigger than ourselves, don't they, you know? come together, nobody got hurt, everybody had a good time. I'm sure some people missed some bad sunburns. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it, it changed my life. It's, it's something about just that scene. When we thought we were creating a brave new world, I'm still a true believer. Thank you. Okay, we all happy here? Okay, well, nice talking to y'all and uh, be seeing you around the uh, uh, universe. Bye.
a little bit more to life than just, you know, sex and drugs. Not much more, but there is more. Yeah. You, know, right? yeah, but you know what I mean? It's like, oh, come on. Where is the white Volkswagen van on the... Okay, it's over here on the hey, north if, side if, of the field. If you all refrain from trying to hop this fence, you wouldn't, you wouldn't puck yourselves up. <laughs> <laughs> 